Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome. This is our fourth lecture of the Introduction to Family and Kinship course in India. Today we are going to discuss the idea of how North Indian kinship operates through marriage and a system of gift giving. Gift giving and the idea of prestations is, has a long tradition within the anthropology of kinship and the anthropology of economies. This is an important method by which people link and create exchange. As discussed in our first lecture, the study of Levi Strauss' idea of kinship is not only based on the difference between nature and culture or the coming together of nature and culture, but through the idea of how exchange works. Exchange in its very basic form involves not only the exchange of goods and services, but as Levi Strauss discussed, the exchange of women itself. So cross cousin marriage is a form of exchange that occurs between two brothers. We have been discussing over three lectures now how important marriage is to the whole idea of kinship. Exchange is conceptualized as a form of marriage. However, for the purposes of what we do today, uh, North Indian kinship or what Iravati Karve called Indo-Aryan kinship is also based on this very important idea of gift giving. Now exchange is also linked to the uh, giving of gifts and the return of gifts. If you know a simple idea of gift giving, when you give a gift, you incur obligation on the person you're giving the gift to. It's an obligatory relationship. When you take a gift, you must return it. However, this gift giving relationship works in different modes in different societies. You may give a gift and refuse to return it, uh, refuse to, uh, you may take a gift but refuse to return it or you may give a gift and never get a return, that happens too. But ideally a gift giving relationship comes with its own set of rules and obligations. This is important to understand how kinship works because kinship too is based on an idea of gift giving. We will go into it in detail as we go along in this lecture but for the purposes of beginning this lecture, I would like to recall the last lecture and our focus on blood and symbolism. If you recall, we discussed Schneider's notion of how symbolic ideas of kinship work, uh, help us to understand cultures better. Within such an idea, blood works very importantly. We understood and talked about Rokto in Bengali kinship and Utampa and Uyir in Tamil kinship. For today's lecture, we begin and continue with this idea of blood within North Indian kinship to build a bridge to the idea of how gift giving comes through. You will understand as we go along. Within North Indian kinship, one of the earliest studies to be undertaken was that by Paul Hirschman of Punjabi kinship. Paul Hirschman studies Punjabi kinship especially from the vantage point of how procreation works within it. Unlike other cultural analysis where procreative ideologies are very important as we saw in the case of Bengali kinship where Ostor and Frizzetti talk about the seed and the earth and in case of Tamil kinship where Stephen Barnett talks about the Utampa and Uyir, in case of Punjabi kinship, Paul Hirschman is very clear about the importance of procreative ideologies. He sees procreative ideologies as having a very minimal importance. The importance instead is based on how procreative ideologies are, manu are understood and imagined through the idea of superstition. So conception within Punjabi kinship is not as detailed or as uh, imagined as it is in Bengali kinship. This is particular because this means according to Hirschman that Punjabi kinship uh, encourages and gives importance to both the mother and the father's contribution to conception. Unlike in the seed and earth ideology where we know that the father's uh, contribution to the child is much more important than that of the mother's. In case of Punjabi kinship, interestingly, both mother and father have equal contributions to make, both in the act of the conception and in the birth of the child. However, what is important for Paul Hirschman is how superstitious ideas work through these conception ideologies when there is none. 
So for instance, there is a big body of work which encourages couples to think of giving birth to a boy. This is also seen according to T.N. Madan's study of the Pandits of Kashmir, but we'll come to that later. So for instance, copulation on the right side leads to the birth of a girl and on the left side leads to the birth of a boy. These are folk notions and superstitions which are nonetheless very important in how a culture constructs its idea of passing blood and identity. Also within Punjabi kinship, the idea that uh, the post-conception, the first face that the mother sees uh, determines the health and the makeup of the child is very important. Ideally, the first face you see is that of your husband, but it might also be of your mother-in-law in a joint household. That makes up how the child will be born. These are again very interesting ideas through which culture navigates its own sense of progeny and descent. Hirschman's study of Punjabi kinship in that sense brings forth an idea of a more egalitarian system. However, it's not as egalitarian as it seems as we know that sons continue to be privileged within Punjabi society and kinship. What is of importance is how the biological and the social are navigated in North India. Here, no one better than Veena Das constructs a much more nuanced theoretical notion of how Punjabis and North Indians think of their kin ties. In Veena Das's seminal piece called Masks and Faces, she looks at how the biological domain of kinship and the social domain of kinship interact. For her, it's very important to understand that North Indian and Punjabi kinship try to bring together a symbiosis between the idea of nature and culture. Yes, we are back to the idea of nature and culture as Levi Strauss discusses. Because we are constantly mediating with the idea of nature through cultural and social categories, we can never really do away with these categories within the study of kinship. How does Veena Das understand and develop this notion? She suggests that the social construction of the natural tie is essential in the way it is hierarchized. So for instance, the natural tie is of two types. One, that you share with your mother through the act of conception and breastfeeding and nurturance. And the second is the one that you share with your wife through sexual procreation. Please remember that till now, our focus is the ego who is always male. This is important also because we are focusing on patrilineal and patriarchal societies where descent and identity is through men, where even though women are very, very important to the continuance of the descent line. As we go further into the study of kinship, we'll understand how gender enters into the focus and how gender brings together its own nuance. But for the purpose of this particular lecture, we continue to think of the ego as male. Back to Veena Das. The ego as male, therefore, uh, con considers and looks at two natural relationships, which are very, very important. As I said, one with the mother and one with the wife. Both are important and both are in conflict. The son must be, give allegiance to both. Because while the mother has brought the son into this world, the wife helps the son have a child and adds to membership of the descent group. To moderate these two natural categories, the importance of the social category becomes even more important. Therefore, the social category must hierarchize between the relationship shared with the mother and the relationship shared with the daughter-in-law or the wife. Now, this is important in the sense that the relationship that the ego shares with the mother is most important for the biradri or what is known as the larger extended family. The extended family or the joint family in India gives predominance and importance to the tie that the mother and the child share because that is the tie that links the child to the larger family. The construction of the tie with the wife is always laced with a sense of rebellion and danger. The sexual tie that you have with your wife can be a threat to the larger patrilineal descent group. Why? It may lead to fission. We all know that partition in joint households is necessitated by sons breaking away from the joint household. Many people usually blame the daughter-in-law for such a breakup. The daughter-in-law instigates the husband to break up from the larger family tie. This is also important considering what we've been talking about till now, that the patrilineal group depends on the coming in of wives from other households. Even though they may bring in the young girl who becomes part of the household of the husband, her relationship to her husband's kin is always fraught and conflicted. This is because the tie of marriage within Hindu society depends on the breakaway of the girl from her natal kin. We will discuss this further as we go into T.N. Madan's study, 
but for the purposes of what we are talking here, it is important to understand that Veena Das builds on this idea of conflict and fissure to think of how Punjabi kinship is actually discussed and built on. It is not always that kinship is only about bringing together. We must understand that kinship depends to a large extent to ties of conflict. In fact, kinship is endemic and filled with ties of conflict. Fisher is very much a part of the way in which kinship is built. To understand how this kind of friction works, Veena thus builds on this idea of masks and faces. She suggests that the way in which natural behavior or natural ties are mediated through social codes is through the process of, of putting on masks and faces. Here I will take a slight detour to look at how Veena thus depends on Irving Goffman's theory of the dramaturgical approach to build on masks and faces. The American sociologist Irving Goffman uh, coined the theory of the dramaturgical approach to look at how people behave in social interaction. The dramaturgical approach, as the name suggests, draws from the idea of theater or drama. Irving Goffman suggests that people have two sets of interactions that they mediate, one in the front stage and the other in the backstage. The front stage is the relationship that you put in, it's, it is a front, it is a mask that you put in in most of your social interactions. The backstage on the other hand is where you prepare for the front stage. This is an important distinction. Goffman looks at this kind of interaction in, in places such as the asylum, where, which are total institutions, where people may enact as per the rules of the institution and may do something else privately. Goffman also looks at how the dramaturgical approach uh, affects the way people manage things like stigma. Stigma or, or the negative aspect of person's social identity is often mediated through this conversation of the backstage and the front stage. Veena Das uses Goffman's idea of the dramaturgical approach in a very interesting way to look at Punjabi kinship. She uses the idea of the masks and the face to look at how people negotiate these codes of the social and the biological in their intimate relationships. In order to understand and mediate between your relationship that you have with your mother and your wife, you have to be very careful. The biradri looks down upon you to respect your mother and actually place your wife in a subservient position to the entire family. However, as Veena Das notes, the sexual relationship that you share with your wife is equally powerful. While you may love your mother and have a deep relationship with her, your wife's relationship with you marks your engagement with the larger family. So, for instance, in case of conflict, often, Veena Das notes, the overt beating or the physical collective beating of the wife by the man is a sign or an act, a front stage drama that the man puts on in front of the biradri to punish the wife in case she has transgressed against the larger family. In private, the man may then go and apologize to the wife to make up for the beating he gave her in public. Not a very great way to um, legitimize domestic violence, but this is not what I am trying to do. The idea is to actually reflect on Veena Das's theory of how masks and faces work within a larger familial construction in Punjabi kinship. She discusses an interesting case. She discusses the case of a young child within a joint family who is beaten up uh, due to some due to a small transgression on his part by his father's younger brother. On being beaten up by the father's younger brother, his mother comes to his rescue and says certain unseemly things to the father's younger brother, usually known in North India as the Chacha. She reminds the Chacha that if her son was his own son, she would never, he would never have beaten him up. The Chacha takes deep umbrage and anger he is very upset with such an insinuation because he actually says that because his nephew is his own son that he's actually beaten up beaten him up this is an interesting conflict that that blows up to the larger household where the mother-in-law enters and finds her daughter-in-law making unnecessary insinuations against her younger son when finally uh, the man or the ego enters the home to find his wife son mother-in-law and younger brother in conflict, he has to take a, an important decision of constructing masks and faces. While secretly agreeing with his wife on having said what she said to the younger brother, he must put on a face for the larger group 
to quell their fear that he might secede from the family with his, with his wife. So as I mentioned earlier, he beats his wife in front of the whole family to show his allegiance to the larger group, the Biradri. And in private, he apologizes to his wife to keep her happy, to tell her that this was a performance indeed. Punjabi kinship in such, such senses works through different ideas of procreation, biology and nature. At the end of it all, Veena Das suggests that even how we mediate nature is very importantly constructed through social codes, something that we have been trying to establish through these lectures. That society and cultural codes become very important ways in which we must mediate and think of nature. While we privilege the mother's tie and the sexual relationship with the wife, it is important to understand that the identification of natural codes through sexuality and through birth are something that is also embedded in society and culture. Punjabi kinship in that sense comes alive in its nuance of conflict and dissonance. Veena Das has also studied how uh, kinship itself is a very fraught territory. In extending her study of Punjabi kinship, she looks at how national honor and codes are fought through the idea of kinship as well. Her study on national kinship looks at the ways in which post partition the exchange of women across borders of Pakistan and India meant a larger conversation on kinship and nationhood. That kinship is not only restricted to our intimate domains and families, becomes even more important in how we mediate ideas of biology and culture. In her analysis of partition documents, which dealt with the exchange of women from Pakistan and India, Veena Das finds both countries mediating the exchange through identities given to women as wives and mothers and daughters. It is not about the woman who has left or been abducted, but about her identity within a familial setup that becomes the most predominant node of her exchange. So even though a woman who has been abducted across the border now has a family there, she must be brought back and wrenched back to the same household in, in her natal country, whether it's India or Pakistan. This involved a lot of emotional distress and violence, but the idea of it was that all reproductive women must be brought back to the fold from where they must be married into effectively proper social families, from where good progeny can be produced. This is essential to how we think of nature. Progeny, reproduction and familial codes make up for how we construct our idea of biology again and again. As we go further into the idea of kinship and family in India, we will understand that biology forms the undercurrent to what we think of regarding the family. However, it is not biology in its seamlessness, but the way culture and society brings up biology. Before we move on to the idea of gift giving, I would like to look at how biology again becomes an important way in which in another North Indian community, the Pandits of Kashmir. Uh, conception and procreation is again marked through these navigations with biology. Sociologist T.N. Madan in his seminal study of the Pandits of Kashmir looks at how procreation is primarily marked by the desire for a son. This is important in looking at how the Kashmiri Pandit family depends on the son to take the line forward. It is again a patrilineage and the desire for a son is what procreation is, to, is meant towards. Here adoption has a different place. So in case a couple is unable to have a child or do not have a son, adoption is one way out to continue the lineage line. But adoption can only be done through particularly marked uh, strands or relationships. You cannot just adopt any other child. Therefore, according to the Pandits of Kashmir and in Madan's study, the children that you can actually adopt are the father's son the daughter's, sorry, I apologize, the brother's son, the daughter's son, the sister's son and the wife's brother. These are candidates who are allowed for adoption. You may also adopt a daughter to fulfill your duty as a Hindu householder to actually uh, have a daughter to gift in Kanyadan. As we all know, as per Hindu ideology of uh, the correct householder life, which ensures the entry of a Hindu man into salvation and heaven, it is important to have both a son and a daughter. The son is required to carry the line forward and to burn the funeral pyre and the daughter is required to be given away as a pure gift in the form of the Kanyadan. As per strictures, both elements are required 
to live life as a householder. In the absence of either or, amongst the pundits of Kashmir, adoption must be mediated through particular codes. Adoption at the end of the day is not true kinship according to the pundits. We are again at odds as to what true kinship really is. But here according to T. N. Madan's story, story, uh, sorry, study, uh, pun the pundits of Kashmir must mediate adoption in a way in which it fulfills the codes of biology, going back to what Veena Das has discussed. Therefore, a particular kin can only be adopted. Now within such an enterprise, it is important to understand how the mother's brother can also be adopted. Ideally, one should not adopt from the wife's kin because it is seen as unseemly and may be a threat again, again remembering Veena Das and Punjabi kinship, may be a threat again to the larger family, to the larger patrilineal family. The first candidates for adoption should come from within the patrilineage rather than from the wife's family. They are affines and in a gift giving relationship to the patrilineage. Here we enter into the most important section of what we are going to discuss in terms of North Indian kinship, that of gift giving and affinal relationships. As I mentioned earlier, the tie of affinity is very important within the study of kinship. The tie of marriage makes and breaks many things. With the with the, study of, uh, with the study of the elementary structures of kinship, Levi-Strauss made marriage absolutely fundamental to the study of kinship. Even today, most studies on kinship and family across the world are centered on the study of marriage. More so in India, where marriage continues to mark our engagement with India and Indian society. We are obsessed with weddings and how wedding rituals operate even today. Current and contemporary studies in India actually look at the way in, ma in the way in which wedding rituals come to mark contemporary social changes. However, for the purpose of this lecture, I have to I have to insist on the idea that North Indian kinship is very much dependent on the idea of gift giving and prestations. Gift giving, as I was mentioning earlier, is a seminal part of North Indian kinship. This is primarily because of the asymmetric, asymmetrical relationship that wife givers and wife takers share. As mentioned earlier in the first lecture, wife givers and wife takers in the North Indian kinship system are unequal. They are not uh, in a relationship that breeds egalitarianism. The wife giver is always inferior to the wife taker and the wife taker actually is a patron of the wife giver. Even though the gift of the virgin and all other gifts flow from the wife giver to the wife taker, it is in a relationship of inferiority and superiority. Thus, we must understand how this relationship of wife giving and wife taking marks our understanding of North Indian kinship. T. N. Madan begins with the study of the Kashmiri Pandit and refers to three groups of um, relationship that are important for the ego. The first is that of the agnatic kin the second of the non-agnatic kin and the third of affinity. Agnatic kin are those who are linked by blood and in the same descent group. The non-agnatic kin are those other relationships shared through in-marrying wives who as we will see become very very important to the study of Pandit, Kashmiri Pandits. And the third is the tie of affinity which you share with those you give wives to and take wives from. Uh, amongst the Kashmiri Pandits, the women are first and foremost to be identified as wives. Nowhere else within cultural understanding in India is the woman only the wife. The woman is also the mother, the woman is also the sister, the woman is also the daughter. Within Indian culture, the woman is first and foremost the mother. Her status as the mother and her identity as the mother is the most important. Amongst Kashmiri Pandits, interestingly, the woman is first and foremost the wife. She is the wife first and the mother, daughter, sister later. This is interesting because it establishes the idea of exchange between two families. Someone has given the woman as a wife and someone has taken her as a wife. In understanding how she is predominant as the wife, we must look at how the Kashmiri Pandit family is broken up. So, at the center is the Gara or the ego's intimate household, which is also known as the Parivar or Chula. For all of you who do not understand the meaning uh, of Parivar, it means family and Chula is the hearth where food is cooked. Linked to the Gara is the brother's Gara, which may be in the same neighborhood or perhaps in the same house in another section. And 
the gara of other kinsmen, cousins, uncles, mother's brother. These link the ego together into a larger group. This group is known as the kotamb or one's extended family. The kotamb interestingly has two divisions. There is the sakula, sakula or the zamati. and the Amati. The Zamati refers to all those who belong to the same lineage as yourself as the ego. The Amati refers to all those who have married in to your lineage. So, most, pro most uh, the best example of this are in marrying wives such as the daughter-in-law and the mother. Interestingly, for the ego who forms the basis of the Gara and again the male ego, his mother at most times is the Zamati. The mother heads the household, is part of the household and therefore is the Zamati for the ego. But in relation to the Kotamb, she might often become the Amati or the in marrying wife. This is a very important idea which comes through uh, in how women are constructed amongst the Pandits in Kashmir. That they are primarily to be made and unmade through the act of exchange. Even for the children of a woman to think of her as an in marrying wife makes it very important to understand how marriage is constructed amongst the Pandits of Kashmir and how a final relationships are essential to the way in which the ego's identity is constructed. So, besides uh, her identity as a mother, as a wife, the Pandit woman becomes the sole repository of her, of her family's exchange to another family. In that sense, she is known as Amata, Amanat, I apologize. Amanat or the idea of Amanat is that of a property that another family keeps for safekeeping. In that sense, she is already a property that belongs to someone else that her family is nurturing. In North India, the woman as Amanat is a very common idea. As you know, in other parts of North India, women are known as Parayadhan, something I mentioned earlier in lecture 2. Parayadhan also carries with it the idea that a woman belongs to someone else but is in her natal family or in, in the family where she was born only for a short period of time to be nurtured and finally given away. Such an idea is now being strongly contested in society for being both sexist and problematic for women's rights, but we will come to that later. For the time being, such a structural idea carries with the notion that as a wife, the Pandit Kashmiri woman can leave her gara her father's family and go and join her father's gara. The moment she gets married, her father's gara is close to her. She cannot go back. It does not belong to her and she does not belong to it. Instead, she goes, back, goes to her husband's family, which is known as Variu. Here, she slowly, uh, she slowly socializes into becoming, into turning her husband's family household into her own gara. So, the transference of household and household identity happens through the act of marriage. Uh, the other significant study to see how a woman transforms more easily than a man in North Indian kinship is that by R.S. Khare on the transformations that women undergo from being Kanya to Mata, from a virginal uh, woman to that of motherhood. This is critical because at each stage a girl transforms herself from her family of uh, from the family she was born in to the family of her marriage and of her conjugal family, this transformation occurs most on the woman and through the woman. It is very rarely enacted on the man because within patrilineal society, men carry descent and identity, but women must change their identity to become part of the patrilineal setup. So, therefore, the Pandit Kashmiri women, uh, woman uh, is foremost the wife. Her identity as grandmother, mother, sister, daughter comes after her identity as a wife. We see that in the conceptualization of how the ego ultimately thinks of the mother as Amati and not as Zamati, Zamati being your own kin and Amati being in marrying wives. Finally, in the Pandit household, if you are a widow, you are a lost woman. According to T. N. Madan, the widow has no place within the Pandit household. 
she's lost and has no space uh, for redemption. She's not invited to key rituals and is relegated to the household as someone who has no identity or status. We saw this uh, in our brief discussion of Sarah Lamb's uh, study of widows in West Bengal, where too they were relegated to the fringes of the main household because first of all their sexuality and their reproductive uh, status was complicit and secondly because they were unmarried and, and the Hindu woman's primary identity within the patrilineal descent group is through her identity that she shares with her husband and his larger group. So amongst, uh, when you think of the Pandit woman as a wife, certain ideas about wife givers and wife takers becomes more interesting and more nuanced. Tian Madan talks about uh, the Pandits having three sets of wife givers and wife takers which he details through the following diagram. At the center, if we again take our household of reference, that belongs to the ego. The household of reference has two sets of relationships. One is with the wife givers who give them wives, the other is with the wife taker to whom they give wives. However, these two groups have separate relationships with other groups. So for instance, this group may have a wife taking relationship with other wife givers and the same group might have a wife giving relationship to other wife takers. Similarly here, this group might have a wife taking relationship with other wife givers and a wife giving relationship to other wife takers. This basically means that this whole setup does not exist in a vacuum. The ego's family operates through other groups which are linked to each other in this giving and taking relationship. You may also give and take from the same family unheard of but possible, but by and large you continue in an asymmetrical fashion. Therefore, for ego, family becomes bifurcated into three types, the mother's mother's kin, the mother's brother's wife's kin who are not family and the affines who are mother, sisters, husband and children. Let us think about this further. For the ego, his family through the mother's mother's kin becomes very important when we look at uh, rituals and rites of passage. We look at that as we go along. The mother's brother's wife kin is another family but not someone you are related to. Primarily because you have already, your family has already taken a wife from your mother's brother. Your mother has come from your mother's brother's family and you are in a wife taking relationship with your mother's brother's family and the wife's family which is in a relationship of wife giving to the mother's brother. So if this is the mother's brothers, if they are giving you a wife which is your mother, then this is your mother's brother's wife's family and they cannot be kin with you because they are in a relationship of wife giving and you are in a relationship of wife taking it is an unequal relationship again. The twain shall not meet. However, the mother, sister, husband and children are family but known as Ashnav or affines because with the mother, sister's husband's family there is a relationship of gift taking that you share with your, that you have with your mother's brother's family. That makes you affines again because the mother, sister's husband family has also taken women. If you understand this convoluted idea, we will go further to understand how it works. This notion of wife giving and wife taking therefore works in a way in which you as an affine are linked to other wife takers and other wife givers. So your mother's brother family as a family that gives women links you with other groups with who have also taken wives from your mother's brother. Therefore, your mother's sister's 
husband family and you are at the same level of a final relationship. You have taken women from the same group. However, your mother's brother's wife's family is not equal to you and you cannot call them kin either through affinity or through the ties of blood because they have given women to your mother, bro mother's brother which is an asymmetrical relationship. You have not given women to your mother's brother's family. You have taken from them. So therefore, the relationship does not exist. However, most importantly, your mother's mother's family is your closest kin because your mother's mother's family gave a mother to you, gave a woman to your mother's brother's family, just like your mother's brother gave a woman to you. But they are family through the linkages of blood as well. It's a complicated idea, but that works through the idea of giving and taking. Giving and taking, as I said earlier, like gift giving, incurs credit and debit. In Levi Strauss's notion of exchange, when you take women, you incur credit because you have to give a woman back. When you give away woman, you incur debit because you must bring that woman back. It's an interesting way in which to think about marriage exchange, but it reminds you of how most of our relationships are also marked by an economics that we cannot run away from. The economy of the marriage system becomes more and more explicit in the North Indian system as we go into the idea of gift giving or dowry and the hedge. In the North Indian system, marriage exchange is not just the exchange of women, but also the exchange of goods and services. Therefore, the Ashnav, amongst the Pandit, uh, Kashmiri Pandits are a very important relationship of marriage. Amongst the Ashnav, two figures stand out as being very, very important. The first is the wife's brother and the second is the sister's husband. Both men, but both having very different roles and responsibilities. The wife's brother, also known as the mother's brother for the ego, is someone who has a very important role to play in the patrilineage of uh, the ego and his mother. The wife's brother must give gifts at all life cycle rituals. He must be present at life cycle rituals. He must give support and sympathy to the patrilineage. And he is a very, very important part of the family in terms of giving respect. So the wife's brother, interestingly, will always give respect to, to the sister's husband and often to the sister's son even though he's junior than the wife's brother. So the mama, interestingly, will have a very nice, affectionate relationship with the nephew, Bhanja, but there will be this subtle layering of respect as well. If you remember in the first lecture, I discussed Radcliffe Brown's joking relationship where in Africa, the mother's brother is also known as the male mother, replicating the relationship that mothers have with their children in a patrilineage. It is in many ways similar to what T.N. Madan talks about amongst the Kashmiri Pandits. The mother's brother is very important to the structure, but must show deference to the patrilineage. He must show deference to his sister's husband and to his sister's children. He must love them unconditionally, but he also must show them respect. This, on the other hand, is completely overturned when we look at the role of the sister's husband. The sister's husband, interestingly, is a different person. He must be given respect as he's a wife taker. He's invited to all life cycle rituals in his wife's family, but as an officiating senior. He does not have to give any gifts, but he must receive gifts. This is again replaying the unequal relationship that wife givers and wife takers have. So while the wife's brother is a wife giver, he must continuously give gifts through the lifetime. Whereas a wife taker, because he takes wives, must receive gifts through the lifetime. The father, uh, sorry, the sister's husband is treated with great respect and deference is, is often consulted in family matters. The sister's husband must be given due respect at all life cycle rituals. This asymmetrical relationship between the wife's brother and the sister's husband seems very unfair when you think about the woman in between because she remains the node to how these two roles are given structural importance. While the wife's brother is very important, he must continue to offer his services to his sister's family. And while the sister's husband is also important, his importance is relayed in a very different manner. This is important in the way in which gifts are marked out. We want to look at wife giving and wife taking also from the perspective of the gift and how gifts 
are considered and thought of in this kind of marriage exchange. Gifts are of different kinds. Tien Madan talks about marriage gifts, birth ritual gifts, funerary gifts, other gifts. During marriage, uh, he talks about how the girl is the recipient of most gifts. But the girl or the bride may be the recipient of most gifts, which are then relayed back to her husband's family. This is critical because the gifts must flow, as we know, in one direction. So the practice of hypergamy or marrying above your class and caste means that the groom's family becomes the center of great patronage. That the hage or the dan that the girl's family gives is to feed into the superiority of the groom's family. They must not only give, give gifts one way, but the groom's family must never think of reciprocating the gift exchange. They are not expected to give gifts back. They are expected to receive them. There is no sense of obligation or deference to the gift giver. In fact, there is a sense of entitlement, which explains why the hedge or dowry is such a uh, flawed system in itself, which involves inequality and deep exploitation. In a structural sense, the giving of the gift therefore entails the receiver to be a patron. You will never see the groom's side shy away from taking gifts because structurally they are expected to take it. They are expected to take it and not feel apologetic about it. This is different from gift giving as we understand it. You do know that when your friend gives you a gift on a birthday, you have to give it back on his or her birthday. That's just how it works. If you don't give the birthday gift back, your relationship is over. I'm being dramatic, but it is true about the gift giving relationship. You also know that a gift entails many different kinds of obligations. Therefore, in earlier anthropological studies, especially amongst the Trobra and Islanders close to Australia, gift giving was a whole system itself where certain tribes gave gifts and took gifts over a long period of time to maintain harmony and respect amongst each other. Thus, not giving a gift back is sacrilege. However, if you look at the wife-giver, wife-taker relationship in North India, not giving a gift back is part of the system. Not only that, marriage rituals are not the end of gift giving. Gift giving continues for the rest of the girl's family's life. One of the reasons which is used to justify the killing of young girls at birth or what is known as female feticide in India. The kind of expense that the bride's family incurs does not stop at the marriage ritual. Post-marriage, the birth of the first child is something that the grandparents should effectively participate in. The maternal grandparents and the mother's brother must give important gifts at this stage. Just to digress, in Bengali kinship, for instance, the first feeding of the child comes from the mother's brother. In other Indian cultures as well, the role of the wife's family at the first birth ritual is essential especially if it's a boy, in which case the gifting becomes that much more important. However, um, this sense of reciprocity does not come from the boy's family. The boy's family may enact gift giving again in relation to their own wife takers, families they marry their daughters into. But as you remember from the matrilateral cross cousin marriage exchange, asymmetry means that wife givers can never be wife takers to each other. That would mean a form of egalitarianism and equality where gifts are given and taken back. Not something that is accepted, acceptable within North Indian kinship system, but if you remember, very much acceptable within the Dravidian kinship system. Now, this means that certain kinds of gifts are given and not given. So, for, uh, so according to T. N. Madan, women often get a part of their inheritance during the marriage rite. This is also because within the patrilineal system, women or daughters do not inherit property from their fathers. The property is passed down to sons and their co-parseners uh, or brothers. This means that the marriage gift or the dahej becomes a form of stridhan. Madan has of course looked at it in detail in his article which you can refer to. But the idea of the stridhan has often been used in Indian legal codes to 